Well, hey, everybody. It's Romania Black. <laughs> and we are at this point uh, halfway through season one of the Apothecary Diaries. And it seems quite fitting because I'm about halfway through uh, my last Eunuch in China book, which has gotten, which has taken a very um, spicy turn. So we're going to talk about that today. But we've also got a lot of comments to get through. So, oh! Yeah, um, there's still the wooden tablet mystery, which, dear God, <laughs> hopefully they, they'll play we round that out since it's the end of the, the end of the core. Um, it has been confirmed. We're going to talk about this a little bit, but it has been confirmed. There were two cores, kind of like what I talked about previously. It does seem like they finished the first core around Christmas and then after New Year's, they picked up the second core. So it wasn't long of a wait, but that does make an impact. I feel like in terms of arcs and how the studio set things up, they want you to end on one arc ending and another one beginning for episode 13. So I think that's all very important to note. So um, let's dive into the comments and then we'll talk about the book before we dive in. So this is probably going to be, as you would expect, a long introduction. So Ellie, uh, Eli, 4644, talked about how, as well as Makamu 12, so both these individuals talked about the same thing, that the mangaka was suspended for a three-year sentence. Several weeks ago, I talked about how one comment said the mangaka was in jail. So like, oh, there's not going to be a manga anymore. It's going to delay the seasons. Blah, blah, blah. Well, first of all, they were already doing season two in construction. So I doubt that that was going to affect anything. They're already basing it off manga content that was available that's not going to be an issue. But Eli4644 and Makamu12 talk about how the mangaka was actually just suspended for three years. The 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 uh, justice system in Japan is a little bit different than the U.S. <laughs> so surprising no one. Um, but they're not in jail. They can still work on the manga as long as they don't commit any further crimes within that three-year suspension. So basically they're on lockdown for three years with the government being like, don't commit fraud, <laughs> don't do tax evasion anymore, if that was the case. You know, I'm not saying it was, but um, I don't exactly remember the news story, but it was something along those lines. Basically the thing is they've told the mangaka for three years, you got to not do that. And then if you cannot do that, you won't go to jail. So they could still work on the manga. So I don't feel like it's going to suspend or delay anything with this series, which is good. Obviously, do your taxes. But at the same time, I do think that it's important to note that. So if people are like, oh, there's not going to be this. There will be. It's just, it's a different circumstance. Sarah points out that hairpins not only have the the hitting meaning, which is the dates, as we've come to, learn, uh, come to know, but also they can be used to recruit talented workers. So Li Hua giving Mao Mao her hairpin basically marks her as special and valuable, which I think is important to note because I think Mao Mao, Mao, Mao believed early on in the series that her standing out would make her a target and a bad thing. And I could totally understand where she's coming from with that. But I think that as the series has gone on now and we've seen how the others kind of act around Mau Mau and they do recognize her as someone of value that's really, really good at her job, I think that her standing out is going to be a benefit more than a bane. But we'll see where the show decides to go with that. But I appreciated that. Um, H Banana 7 points out that Mau Mau doesn't only look at the science, like with the fingerprints on the cup, but also thinks about the logic of why the prints are in a certain location. And I kind of love that about this show because it is taking place during a period in history where we don't have like the modern CSI forensic investigation science. That's not around. So the technology is not there. So instead you have to rely upon, okay, well, why are the fingerprints at the top of the cup? What would be the purpose of it? We don't know where those fingerprints go to, but why are they there? What could that tie to? And I think that that's maybe the author commenting kind of on how, you know, in modern, I'm not saying it's a direct link, but in modern society, a lot of times we just say, oh, we'll let the technology do it. We don't question the process or the methods behind it. We just think, oh, the technology is going to point out who did it and we're done. And it's very convenient, but in efficiency isn't always the best. And I think that there needs to be an understanding of the science and the logic behind it. And so I appreciate that this series kind of takes the time to craft that in, which makes it very good. So I liked that a lot. Also, everything is a facade. The, the pleasure district, 
the whole Imperial Palace setup, everything in this series, even when it comes down to Mau Mau and Jinchi and how they present themselves, there's so many personas and walls. It's like, I feel like during this series, it's all going to come crashing down one by one. It's just a matter of time and how it happens. So thank you, H Banana, for that comment. And then Anime Annie talks about how Mau Mau feels more trusting in people in similar positions to deal with her as to deal with herself like Gaoshin and Gyokyo she trusts in them a lot and I like that Anime Annie points this out because yeah Gaoshin is a eunuch that's serving Jinshi he's very kind and considerate and she feels like a trust between them he's also very genuine so she kind of feels like she can trust him Gyokyo she's a concubine and Mau Mau kind of sympathizes with her situation that even though she does have some power and relegation she's stuck in a relationship she doesn't want necessarily so I feel like Mau Mau feels like she can trust them, but when it comes to Jinshi, he's in a position where he deals out punishment. So he's in a position of authority and Mau Mau seems to kind of naturally withdraw from authority because she knows how dangerous it is to be associated with them. So I feel, I feel bad for Jinshi because he loves her and he wants to develop a relationship with her and she's like she's keeping him at arm's length and it's like oh no damn it no girl you don't realize so I thought that was interesting to note so I really like those comments but I want to talk to you all about this book <laughs> about this book because there's a lot of things I I've gotten to the halfway point there's a lot of things in these passages I want to talk with you about um as we go the the first part uh chapter five here like on page 126 they start talking in detail about a couple things that we've seen actually in the show so the emperor had a doctor kind of like the quack doctor here and what's interesting to note is that the physician that he had his father was like really well known in the community he had a lot of kind of like very unorthodox methods that worked and so he was very well respected and he just liked to take risks but they usually paid off whereas the doctor for the emperor he was kind of very cautious and sort of like i don't want to take risks because what if i kill someone and everybody kind of knew it so he wasn't as respected which is interesting to note but apparently the empress who married puyi the emperor uh wanrong she succumbed to a lot of illness and we'll talk about that illness here in a little bit but it was interesting because Puyi would like demanded to be there with the doctor at all times as he diagnosed her Puyi was kind of a little bit micromanaging as we find out in the book and he liked to be kind of in control of a lot of situations the funny thing is he kind of wasn't in control because the empress Gigi was like have fun and she was kind of running the country behind his back so but we'll talk about in this. So I thought that was really interesting. Also, we found out in, in this Imperial Palace, the eunuchs were the taste testers. So the Empress had taste testers, but they were eunuchs. So there weren't any handmaidens or ladies in waiting doing the tasting. It was eunuchs for him that would do it. And that kind of fed into, we've talked in previous weeks, that Puyi kind of was a little paranoid at times of the eunuchs. So them being the taste testers makes a lot of sense. And I've got my notes here. So they talk in this book about Wanrong and her illness and what it comes down to is she was lonely the empress was lonely because of her relationship with Puyi and we'll talk about that in more detail here in a second but they go on this big link uh, Sun Yao Ting talks about the consort uh which was Wenju and Wanrong and says the imperial consort Wenju was not as pretty as Wanrong she appeared to be a bit shorter and spoke in a softer voice, but she enjoyed reading and practicing calligraphy. Like Wanrong, she was tolerant towards her servants. The thing is, Wenju, I think, knows the situation that she's in. She doesn't like Puyi at all. Like, she just kind of, like, flits him away. She's like, yes, I know you're your consort. I know you're not interested. Bye. And she just sends him away constantly. And she's very rude, very short, which I thought was interesting that this consort, she talks very sternly to the emperor. And it's just like, I don't have time for you. Bye. And Sun Yao Ting talks about how everybody just kind of, like, looked around like, well, what is she? can she get away with that? And she does. Puyi just is like, okay, I'll leave you. But her thing was she had lots of hobbies and lots of relationships inside the imperial palace and she kept herself busy quite a bit wanrong didn't really have those same interests and she was kind of more dependent upon puyi's affections and when they weren't met she kind of was just lonely and she'd like 
try to form relationships with the eunuchs and like talk to them and be like, what do I do? And I felt bad for her because she just seemed like she was just stir crazy in this giant palace with no one to be with and wanting a relationship that wasn't working. And so I felt kind of bad for her throughout all of this. But they're set up as rival candidates. And at least the emperor in this book seems to be treating Wenju well. He like, you know, gives her like an attendant in waiting. He checks up on her and she just doesn't have anything to do with him. So I thought that part was interesting. But then there is um, the opening of this part here on page 130 where Sun Yating, our precious innocent bean, who is who does not know anything about sexual, you know, he's been a eunuch since he was age six. So he's just grown up in the palace system. He's heard of things from other eunuchs. He knows a lot of eunuchs are like obsessed with sex because they can't, you know, interact and engage with it in the same manner as other people. So he kind of has a very naive understanding of sexual activity. But this part here, I'm going to read this verbatim to y'all because I was just sitting there like, oh! So it starts with saying a telephone line between the Mind Nurture Palace and Wan Rong's bedchamber was installed after Pu Yi's wedding. Occasionally, he made a phone call to tell her he was coming or just to say hello. And Sun Yating was her attendant. So shortly after he came to the Palace of Gathering Elegance, Sun Yao-ting sensed that something was wrong between the imperial couple, even though he could not put his finger on it. One day, Pu Yi suddenly emerged, going straight into Wan Rong's bedchamber. Without bothering about formalities, he threw himself on the bed. Come over, he said to Wan Rong. After a short moment, he called out, Somebody, come here! Sun Yao-ting, who'd been waiting outside, hurriedly entered the room, only to find the imperial couple lying in bed together. Pu Yi had Wan Rong in his arms and seemed to be feeling her up. Sun Yao Ting stepped back hastily, but Pu Yi threw him a glance and ordered, come in. Your majesty, what do you need? Sun Yao Ting felt embarrassed with one foot in the door and the other outside. Nothing. Just stand over there. Pu Yi sat up and pointed to a corner of the room, and then he laid down again. Wan Rong blushed and turned her face to the wall. Pu Yi continued to hold her and talk to her, but their conversation sounded rather clumsy. What did you eat today? Nothing special, just the same old dishes. If there's anything you want to eat, tell them to buy it for you. I can't think of anything special, really. Wanrong had apparently lost interest in the subject. Sun Yao Ting stood in the corner, feeling very awkward, with Pu Yi fondling his empress without passion and striking up a conversa and trying to strike up a conversation. He feigned a fit of severe cough and slipped out of the room. And a moment later, Pu Yi left. So in that moment, it's like, well. I mean, and the thing about it is Sun Yao Ting at the time doesn't realize he's like, why do I have to stand here in the corner while the emperor is apparently trying to have a moment with the empress? And you find out later that there are a lot of rumors floating around about the emperor and the fact that him and Wan Rong are not intimate or seem like a couple at all. And so to me, now the book doesn't say this, of course, because Sun Yao Ting is very much like, I don't want to, you know, this is just conjecture, you know, as Mao Mao would say. But to me, it appears like Pu Yi was wanting to create a scenario where Sun Yao Ting saw them be intimate and then would tell the other eunuchs like, oh, I saw him with the Empress. They were totally in bed together getting it on. And then that would stop the rumors. But he just couldn't create the atmosphere. And Sun Yao Ting's like, well, this is really awkward. And plus, Sun Yao, Sun Yao Ting is like, I'm not talking to anybody about what I've seen because I don't want to get in trouble. As we find out here later. So Pu Yi, again, is very paranoid about the eunuchs and the rumors are spreading. He gets mad at a eunuch the next day and like smashes a plate over their head and causes it to bleed. And then when the other eunuchs are like, well, you know, we've heard that the emperor, you know, he's not seeing the empress and, you know, there's maybe other stuff going on. They all have in their mind, they think that the emperor is maybe having an affair with his head eunuch and maybe that's what's going on. And, but they're, but Sun Yao Ting is like, well, I don't want to get involved. He's like, I just know all Sun Yao Ting says, he, enter, he gets involved in the gossip a little bit. And all he says is, well, I, I know the empress tells him to leave as soon as he gets there. And the emperor hears that. And so Sun Yao Ting has a moment here where he basically is on his knees begging in front of the emperor and the emperor like makes him say what he said and he tells him and he basically drags him across the floor but he doesn't hurt him and he ends up being okay with it but it's like a very close call and Sun Yao Ting's like I could have been killed if I'd said any more because he would be an easy expendable person to get rid of 
So anyway, the other thing I want to note is that Puyi, again, very paranoid about the gossip going around the palace. They talk in the book about the eunuch saying he's taking the land way instead of the waterway. <laughs> so I was like, what is that? And they talk about, and because Sun Yao Ting is like, what do you mean by waterway and landway? And they're like, well, you've been in the palace for some time and you still don't know? His majesty prefers the landway of eunuchs to the waterway of the empress. Basically insinuating that the emperor is gay. Now, throughout this story so far and everything Sun Yao Ting says, I kind of get that impression too, because a lot of people at the time were saying, you know, in over 200 years of the great Jing, no other emperor has ever behaved this way. Like he should have hundreds of concubines and all this. Like a lot of the town gossip is, well, why does he only have one empress and one consort? Like, why doesn't he have hundreds? Like, you know, is expected of tradition. And a lot of the eunuchs are kind of guessing like, eh, he's not interested at them at all. So he just kind of like, for political reasons, humors Wanrong and Wenju. Wenju's accepted it. She's like, fine with this. If I get to stay in a palace and get waited on hand and foot, I'm okay with this. But Wanrong seems very distraught and very lonely. And she just has like fits of outbursts of emotion because she's just so frustrated by the situation, but she can't do anything about it. So I will make note, by the end of this one section that I read, they do talk about the emperor tries to make her feel better. Like he takes her like on a special trip with Sun Yao Ting and they go visit this one place and walk around in this garden and she loves it. And he does seem like he was trying to be nice to her. He was never mean or abusive to it, to her, Wenju, but it seems like Wan Rong and Wenju both kind of see the writing on the wall. Like we're not getting anything out of this. And so it just, I kind of feel a little bit bad for Puyi because if you think historically, He's the emperor and he can't really do what he wants to do. So he's just trying to like put up a front and be like, yeah, I'm the emperor. And we're, yeah. I felt kind of bad for him because I was like, damn, the way that Sun Yao Ting describes all the situations he's in, he seems like he's just forced trying to be straight and he's not. And these two women are just like, we'll have to deal with it. And that's where we're at. So it's, it was fascinating, but the idea that poor our poor eunuch had to stand in the corner while he was awkwardly trying to do something sexual with her is, I was like, the scandal. <laughs> so that that's very interesting so far. So that that's where I'm at. I'm halfway through. My goal is that by the time we finish the series, I'll have finished the book. So it's like the slowest reading I've ever done on a book, but I've also got a lot of stuff going on, on the channel. So what can we do? But anyway, so I'm super excited uh, to start this episode and to be at the halfway point. I hope you all are as well, but I've talked for 17 minutes. We're not going to waste any more time. We're going to dive right into the Apothecary Diaries, episode 12, and we're going to do that here in three, two, one, and let's uh, go. Oh! <laughs> halfway through the season right so we're halfway through oh my god i oh this episode was great i was really worried for a second about this episode because i was like no they were starting to give us angst and i was like oh no don't do this stop it which i i'm sure that this series is going to give us angst i'm sure it is because what romance doesn't have angst in it and there was a, a meme shared on the discord where jen she's like this is a romance story and mau mau's like this is a detective story <laughs> and i was like yes mau mau and jen she are on two different wavelengths right now as to what genre of story this is and i'm like why can't it be both why does it have to be one or the other so there was a lot of angst at the beginning of this episode. I was like, no, don't you dare have this miscommunication, this stupid miscommunication. You two just need to talk it out. Especially when Jin, she was assuming what she would want based on what she said before. But I'm like, you know that she is the way she is, Jin, she. And Gao Shun's like, I can't tell him. What do I do? He's, I got to let him leave the nest. So, uh, and yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, we still don't know some things, and I brought Whiteboard Kun out to kind of trace where we're at in the series so far. We still don't, if we have questions about the series at this point, the questions that I, the only question I really have is Jin Shi actually a eunuch? 
that's the only thing that I really have a question about because he's the emperor's son inadvertently. Now I did do a little bit of research after last episode, the episode with all the exposition, I did do a little bit of research and it was practice in China that sometimes the emperor's brother would get, would be castrated so that he couldn't ab he couldn't take the throne away from the emperor. So if Jin Shi, who's actually the emperor's son, was being touted as the emperor's brother. Yes, in ancient China, there was a history of some brothers of the emperor being castrated so that they couldn't take the throne from the emperor. So it is very possible that he's a eunuch. It is also possible he's not a eunuch. We don't know because it could be that since he's the emperor's brother, he's not a eunuch, but Mao Mao thinks that he is. So I'm assuming he is. It's just not been 100% confirmed and since we found out he's actually the emperor's son and people may have found out about that that's the only question i have and at this point the series has not con concretely made it known which to me to me that kind of is suspicious because it makes me think that maybe he's not because if the show was really just gonna make it concrete i mean mao mao's word is all we really have to go off of she's like oh he's a eunuch of course but i'm like is he are you right, Mao Mao? Are you being an unreliable narrator? I, I don't know. So I don't know if it's true or not. And there's reasons why he could be. There's reasons why he couldn't be. So, and the show doesn't want to give us like a straight up concrete answer, which makes me a little suspicious. Like maybe he isn't, but I, I'm assuming that we'll at some point, we had, you know, a few episodes ago, him breaking down over Aduo leaving. So, and he had that breakdown moment with, Mau Mau. So I'm thinking we'll get more vulnerability out of Jinshi, which for the record, good. I, it's so refreshing to see the female protagonist being the one that's like hyper realistic, hyper sarcastic, hyper like dry and just like n an aromantic, not knowing like, like the advances of the other party. And for the male character to be the one that's like head over heels in love with her because in real life, it's the same thing. What's funny is my coworker reminds me a lot of Mau Mau. She is very like dry, very no nonsense, very business. She's really funny. But then her fiance, he like sends her flowers every week. And he's like, I just want you to feel great and have a great day. He's like a, a damn Labrador. He's like the best. And I'm like, girl. And she's like, I know. I got a good one. And I was like, dang it. And he's like this gamer that sends her flowers. And he all, he's like an IT guy. He works for an IT company, but he likes playing video games and he like sends her flowers and he's super nice. And I'm like, damn girl, you lucked out. And she's like, I did. And I was like, Ugh. but yeah, they remind me a lot of that. So, and, th and that just to me is in real life. I feel like, especially, I don't know how other societies are. Obviously Japanese culture is very different than Western culture, but in the U S there's such a fixation upon hyper masculinity and we got away from it. I thought toxic masculinity was not a thing, but now we have this whole alpha thing and all that, but there's all this like toxic masculinity of guys having to be like, no crying tough, no vulnerability. And I'm like, that's not human. Every human has vulnerability. And what's wrong with being a decent, nice person? Like, what is wrong? So I like that Jinshi is a great example of you can be a badass swordsman, as we've seen him practice uh, with Basin a while back, but you also can be, you know, head over heels in love with someone and it's fine. Like, normalize people having emotions <laughs> across all genders. Am I right? So, so here's our situation and they never fully resolved just outright the whole debacle with the tablets, but it is what it is. And it kind of, here's my, here's my thinking of it now. And I could be wrong. The show may inform us or not inform us, but my thing was we had the, we had the apiary that Fang Ming was working for, right? And that's where we got the whole poison situation which caused all of this to go down, right? So within the apiary, we also had uh, the workers that were connected to making the honey and all of that, right? They were connected to that and to that. So obviously who they're, who they're trying to get and punish are everybody connecting, connected to Fang Ming, right? So then... The workers, though, 
you had the ones that kidnapped Mau Mau. The ones that kidnapped uh, other workers in the rear palace, which include Mau Mau. So if you're punishing all the ones associated with Fang Ming, well, we find out that there was 80 out of the 200 workers, which is a pretty big, steep cut that were involved. So if we're not going to punish them, the solution is that we're going to let them go. That we're going to let them go. And in the book, in, you know, The Last Eunuch in China, which I've moved over there, um, in that book, they do talk about that this whole process of like layoffs and revamping the palace and rehiring happened a lot. Like this was pretty commonplace. Like it, they talk about it in the book, how with every changing regime, with every changing emperor, with every changing dowager empress or consort, you had a whole new set of eunuchs come in. You had a whole new set of workers. There were obviously some that had been there from the beginning of certain dynasties and certain reigns and they kind of had established themselves and they weren't going anywhere. But a lot of the eunuchs were based on personal preference. So as soon as that one person that had hired them was gone, so were they. Um, a lot of times based on the economy, they would have eunuchs being laid off or they would hire on new eunuchs based on the preferences of the royal family. Did they want more eunuchs? Did they want less? Th there was a lot of shift. And so ideally, once you got in the rear palace and you were working there, you didn't want to leave because it was good money, especially compared to what was going on the outside where a lot of people were in poverty. So you didn't want to lose that job, but it was not a steady, stable income. You really had to work to establish yourself and make yourself useful where they didn't want to get rid of you. And that's kind of like Sun Yao Ting at this point. I think he's like 16 or 17. He's been working there since he was like seven. So he's established himself over the last decade and he works really hard. And that's why they keep him. They're like, you're a hard worker. We don't want to get rid of you. And you keep to yourself. You don't blab and, and gossip. We want to keep you here because you're, you're useful. So this whole situation is not surprising. So the thing is, then we have the situation of Jinxi. And that's where Jinchi comes into play of all this. So Jinchi has the duty of handing out punishment. After her execution, the assets were confiscated and, under, and all underwent varying degrees of corporal punishment. So everybody that was connected to her had to go through something. And so she was determined to be the sole proprietor of the incident. So Aduo was not blamed, which... Aduo had, Aduo had nothing to do with this, so good. Glad she didn't get blamed for something she was not involved in, especially after we find out that Fang Ming is kind of responsible for her child's death or her nephew's death. So especially after that, I'm glad that Aduo wasn't, you know, blamed and inadvertently neither was Jinxi. <laughs> so... But they said that the, here's a list of Fang Ming's family members and those connected to them. So her family members tied to the workers that were merchants helping her in this whole thing. And then the people tied to the merchants are the ones that they're like, well, if we're getting rid of all of them, we've got to get rid of the ones that did business. There are about 80 children of those families in the rear palace, which is 80 out of 2,000. Okay, so 80 out of 2,000. Let's just do some simple math, which is <laughs> not my forte. 80 out of 2,000 is 4%. That's still, 4% is quite a bit. That's, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but 80 people is, you know, that's still a lot to manage and go through. He's like, that's quite a hit ratio. Yeah. The family the apothecary was kidnapped and sold off to was one such family. Mm-hmm. So he's like, what do I do? And Gaoshun offers him an out. Gaoshun's like, we could conceal this. We could keep her here. We could make an exception. What? Why not? You know, Gaoshun, Gaoshun knows that I think that Gaoshun is starting to be on the cusp of realizing, if he's not realized this episode, that Mau Mau is not just a toy of Jinshi. He has feelings for her. And they're more than just what he's had with other women in the past. And Gaoshun's like, well, we could make an exception. I don't think Gaoshun would do that with other women in the past that have come across Jinxi. 
But then Jen, she talks about, he's like, yeah, I could do it. Whether it's right or wrong, I could make an exception for her. But then Jen, she's thinking about this. He's like, Mau Mau is all about, you know, her sprinkle of justice. If he makes her an exception, what would she think? And I don't think when Mau Mau, we'll talk about her in his conversation later. I don't think she was thinking about the implications like he was. He was thinking back to their conversation a few episodes ago where she was like, you're the one giving out justice. I'm just a servant girl. I don't bear any exception over anybody else. You're going to have to, you know, if you're, if you're doing justice right, you're going to have to treat me no different than any other <laughs> servant here. And that's kind of where Jin Shi's at a conflict with because he does treat her as an exception. He does treat her as my dog's like, please. But I was this. He does treat her as an exception to the rule. And she's like, well, that's not fair. You know, if you're doing your job properly and appropriately, you're going to treat me no different than anybody else. It's like, mm, but that's not the case. So I feel like Jin Shi's kind of torn between he wants to make an exception. He wants to let her go and keep her here in the rear palace and keep her by his side so that she, he can, you know, be with her because he loves her. But then he's like, what if she finds out that he made an exception and kept her and let all these other women go? He's like, would she get mad at him and be like, well, you didn't do justice like you're supposed to because you made an exception for me. And he's like, He's like, ah. he's like, he wants to do right by her logic and her morals, but he also wants to keep her around him. So it's like, he wants, you know, so he can't do it. He can't go against, you know, behind the backs. He's like, she'll obey any order, no matter how much she disagrees. It would be simple to give the order, conceal the facts and keep her at the rear palace. But if that goes against her will... How would she feel if she learned that she was forced to stay in a place that she disliked? So he thinks that she doesn't like it there. He thinks she doesn't like it. She thinks he doesn't like him or being there, which I'm like, Jinchi, I want to strangle you. So he thinks she doesn't like it there. And he wants to set her free. Despite how he feels of wanting to keep her near him which is like ah so and to me that just tells me i'm glad they address it in this episode where the two of them talk at the brothel i'm glad they talk about it and they both kind of realize wow we really don't know anything about how each other truly feels about this mao mao has her principles and she has how she presents herself jin she has his now he presents themselves but they both put up certain walls of illusion so in the brothel they both kind of realize we really don't know how each other thinks about this in truth and maybe in future episodes they could talk about that who knows and my dogs are gonna bark because huckleberry is the worst <laughs> so and I, I love that Jin Shi is like, he's actually, he's so considerate of her. Like he thinks of what she would want. He, he obviously has desires. He doesn't want the rift between them getting any further, but he's more concerned with how she feels than how he feels. And I'm like, my heart. I'm like, Jin Shi, you are your partner goals. You are like, you're, you're handsome. You're snarky. You're a peacock, but you're considerate. Like, what is this? What is this? What is this standard you're setting? And Gao Shun's like, well, I thought she was just a convenient pawn. Gao Shun is trying to just get Jin Shi to come to terms with his feelings. Gao Shun's like, I thought she was just a pawn. I thought she was just a toy. This shouldn't be a hard decision. And Jin Shi, it's like he wants Jin Shi to admit that he likes her. And instead here we are but we're making progress we're making progress so mao mao finds out about the layoffs and he's like oh uh, he's like she's like i don't know how i feel about this because and then we have mao mao over here who mao mao has some concerns her concerns is that she still owes she owes the landlady at the brothel money which is interesting because we haven't really talked about Mau Mau and her role at the brothel before she left or was kidnapped. We know she's lived with her dad and she's done some apothecary work, but at the same time, basically what's happening is the landlady is helping to support her dad. 
So she's trying to pay her back for supporting her dad is what's happening. But since Lihaku, she hasn't been able to send any more customers to help pay off of her loans. And so she's in all this debt and financial woe. And she's like, I don't want to get, which I was like, no, she does not want to get sold off by the landlady. And uh, on the surface, you would think you're like, well, the landlady's not going to sell her off because she's been there a whole life and she's connected to her dad and all of this. But unfortunately, the realism of the scenario is that in this type of environment, money makes the world go round. If the landlady really needs money and some guy comes up and he's like, I want to buy her and take her off your hands, business-wise, I don't think the woman would stop him. And the dad would be heartbroken, but he'd also be like, what can we do? We don't have much of a choice. I need the money to live. And, you know, it's, it's almost like a duty situation, which I'm really afraid of that. This episode kind of presented the scenario that, that Mau Mau could be purchased and the landlady didn't seem that too troubled about it. She almost seemed to be like, encouraging it so she could make money so i was like mm. it definitely made me think of memoirs of a geisha where the woman owning the geisha house she was really just concerned about profit she's like love is stupid like love doesn't exist in the real world not in the world that we live in and so that became a big issue in that film so i'm worried that some guy is gonna see her without the freckles and think she's cute and try to buy her and then jen she's gonna be like and that's, that's going to be the catalyst. If some guy tries to buy her and Jin, she's like, no, at that point, then it's going to be like, okay, well, why aren't you letting this happen? Jin, you know, this is how the world works. And that's when Jin, she's going to have to be like, no, I love her. I don't want, she's not yours. I don't want to give her up to you. And it's like, Argh. and that opens up like a whole nother can of worms. But Mau Mau really doesn't want, she's like, if I go back now, she doesn't want to be sold off to a customer. That's the last thing she wants to do. And I think that it it means so much to how Mau Mau really feels when she goes looking for Jinshi. Her, like, running around the palace. I did like the way it was animated. I loved the animation and how it was done. I really liked it and how it, like, just focused on her running and she can't find Jinshi. Meanwhile, I liked the contrast of Jinshi being in this open in Aduo's open palace where it's all just empty it almost feels like he's he was I wondered in the reaction if he was avoiding her because he didn't want to talk about her getting laid off but going back and looking at this discussion it seems like he was just going to visit Aduo's palace because now she's gone and some other concubines about to move in and that's his mom and so he's like taking a moment to like look around and be like okay this is gonna change these colors are gonna change all of this is gonna change i don't know how his position is going to change because he's you know her son and the emperor's son he's still working there as the brother of the emperor but i don't know if it's going to change his status any probably not but he definitely felt like he wasn't avoiding mau mau he was just seeing his mother's place before it gets completely remodeled which makes sense if you've ever lived somewhere and then you move away sometimes you drive back by it and you see new people living there and there's kind of like a, a melancholy nostalgia to it so that's kind of how it read to me but by the time she finds him then he's like oh yeah we have to have this conversation and it to me it just speaks volumes that Mau Mau was looking for him out of breath trying to convince him to let her stay not because she likes him necessarily. She's not at that point yet, but because she doesn't want, she, she's gotten comfortable with this existence. She likes the people that are there. She likes the job that she's doing. She doesn't want to go back into this unknown that might lead to a negative situation. And I think it's so interesting because she didn't want to go to the rear palace in the first place. But now she, she has a usefulness and she is kind of spoiled in the sense that she does have a little bit more freedom than she expected, namely because of Jinshi and Gyokyo. But she also enjoys who she's around. And I don't think that that necessarily means that she didn't like the brothel, brothel or the old lady or the three princesses. Or obviously her dad. She loves her father and she loves being around him. But I think that the, the alternative of I could work in the rear palace 
where there is this comfort of Jinshi's mm. not Jinshi's gonna tease me, but at the end of the day, Jinshi's not bothering me, you know, um, and that she gets to do work that she finds fulfilling. I think that that part she's enjoyed versus yeah, she'd be with her father who she loves, but the brothel work is so unpredictable. And it involves her doing things that in no way, shape, or form she's interested in. Like, she could play this instrument and pour tea, but that's the last thing she wants to do. Doing that is not doing her apothecary job. And it's not something she's remotely engaged in. So being in the rear palace gets her the chance to do stuff she likes to do. So, so yeah, so then we have the conversation, and I was like, oh, I was dreading this. I was just dreading this conversation between the two of them where she finds out I'm being let go. So anyway, because Jin, she has to do this, ju dispense this justice. It makes sense. Now the wooden tablets that had the names on them. I wonder if she was throwing them in the fire and disposing of them. So if all of this got exposed, she could find a way, you know, out of the situation. And my dog's trying to get me to play with a toy, but he's not bringing it to me. So no. Um, the funny thing is, this is all connected to Jinshi's heart. <laughs> Just, you know, this whole cycle is basically a big old heart for Jinshi that he has for Mau Mau. And it's like, oh no. So she's like, I'm being let go. And he's like, well, what do you, what do you want to do? And she's like, I'm enjoying my current life. But she's like, I'm just a servant. I have no position to request. That's, this is, this, these two, it was so frustrating in the moment because the two of them internally are being so selfless, right? Jinshi wants to be selfish and keep her there because he loves her and he wants to keep her by his side. She wants to stay there because she's enjoying it and she finds usefulness and purpose. But both of them are so selfless that they're like, well, do I really... Can I really say that that's the right thing to do? She's like, do I really deserve to be here more than anybody else? Can I really exercise this position of power to stay here when I'm just a servant and I'm taking advantage of a situation? Is that right to do? And then she's like, I have the authority. Is it right to do this? And I'm just like, just <laughs> now keys, you know, which we'll talk about that indirect kiss. Don't you worry. But she tries in the moment to say, okay, well maybe Maybe. And I love that Mau Mau's not above it. You know, Jinshi is being very stoic and like, well, I'm not going to like demand her to stay because that would make me not appear like a gentleman in her eyes and she wouldn't want that. Mau Mau was ready to beg. <laughs> she was like, I want to do it. She's like, I want to stay, but I want to appear like I'm not begging. So how can I do that? And it just, it doesn't work. She's like, he's like, as I order, she's like, I'll do my best if I'm ordered to do so. I'll take a pay cut. Just let me stay here. And he's like, well, you'll be compensated. And she's like, what? And she determines it as, oh, he's just doing his job. Didn't, wasn't able to negotiate. He's just doing his job as the authority, like the authority does. Makes sense. Meanwhile, Jinshi is dying inside. <laughs> because he had to make this choice that he thought was the one that she would be impressed by. And I'm like, oh, you two are just bakas, both of you. And then, of course, we have the, the Japanese trope in anime of, like, sitting there growing mushrooms, like, just being miserable. And Gaoshun's like, oh, God, why? We've made a mistake. We've made a mistake. He's like, you should have just let her stay. And so I like that Gaoshun, though, even though she left, he was keeping tabs on her and seeing what happened to her. And I'm like, mm-hmm. He's like, Zhao Zhao went home to the Pleasure District. And he's like, I heard she politely went around and said farewell to everyone she had business with. I love that Gokyo's like, you're going to regret this. <laughs> she's like, she's like, I'm just telling you right now, you're going to regret this and you're probably going to bring her back. So I, at first I was like, why is Gokyo not more mad? But I think she knew. I think she's just sitting there gloating like, you're going to be regretful about this and you're going to bring her back. So have fun being in misery for the next several weeks or whatever. <laughs> So, Gokyo knows she's probably going to come back to their vicinity in some way, shape, or form. Now, Gaoshun, I didn't realize Gaoshun is much older than he appears. I thought they were around the same age. Because, you know, sometimes in anime you can't tell ages very well. But, what we find out is that Gaoshun has been watching over Jinshi since he was a little kid. 
He's like, finding a new toy to replace his favorite one has always been a challenge. And we see him with, with Jinshi when, like, he's, Jinshi's like a little kid in the palace, you know, as the emperor's brother. And he's sitting there, like, trying to get him to play with toys. So they've got to be at least, like, 15 years apart at least. Probably. Which is insane to me because I did not see the age gap being as big as it was. But I like that Gaoshun quickly reflects and he's like, well, wait a minute. We shouldn't probably treat Mau Mau as a toy. No, you should not. And I think that that's a big, that is a big factor in this series is that a lot of men that come to the brothels, obviously a lot of them are coming to the brothels for the women's talent to give them money, to pay them for their services. But we know from Mau Mau's story and from the kidnappers and all of this, that a lot of people, mainly men in this story, treat female characters like their toys, like their tools, like their props. And this series does a good job of showing Jinshi and Gaoshun, you know, coming to determine that no, Mau Mau is not that. And Jinshi's kind of, you know, taking it even a step further, right? But being like that Mau Mau is not a tool. And that's part of his reasoning too. He's like, I didn't want to treat you like a tool that I was just keeping around to use. But he can't come out and say that he loves her because she clearly isn't on the same wavelength yet. And I'm like, Sigh. but I like that he's like, he only let her go because he didn't want to treat her as a tool. Gaoshun's like, well, that's really respectable. What a troublesome master he is. Perhaps I can speak to that military officer. Yeah, maybe he's like, maybe. And that's when Gaoshun's like, I can set up. No, buddy. He's like, I can set up where we can go to wherever Mau Mau is. Gaoshun was the one responsible for this whole thing. What a damn matchmaker. What a damn matchmaker. Gaoshun was in charge of this whole thing. He was like, well, he's like, damn it. He's like, my master is in love with, with this girl. What am I going to do about it? Well, he's in love with her and he's going to be miserable. Like there's just howls moving castle slime coming off of him, <laughs> growing more mushrooms. He's like, I'm going to speak to the military officer, Lihaku, that went to the brothel, find some connections, and we're going to make it. Gaoshin set this whole matchmaking business up where he got it to where they would meet each other. Gaoshin, work. Best, best attendant ever. He's like, we got to solve this. Because then you got to, you got to, uh, to Jinshi. He's like, wah, wah, boo, hoo, sob, sob. I don't know if those are actually the words that Jinshi's saying in the moment or if that's just Gaoshun's impression of him. But anyway, so Mau Mau is made up by the three princesses to go to the party with them. And Mau Mau is beautiful. Like she's just beautiful in her own right. Of course, because of the the beauty standards and stereotypes, the three women with the biggest bosoms get to be the most popular and get to go on stage and do all the work. I do like that there is some positive sex worker talk in this episode. I want to talk about in the reaction, but the three princesses who are running the show essentially and, and making their cash and doing their business, they seem totally fine with all of this. And I think that that's something worth noting because I can be of, I can be guilty of it as well. But when we talk about like feminism and we talk about, you know, I think a lot of people believe that they have this perception of certain waves of feminism where it's like, Oh, women shouldn't be, you know, in any position of subjugation or anything like that, which is true. But I think that sometimes we forget that just like, with men and women equally. Feminism is just equality amongst genders. The, the wave of feminism I subscribe to is just equality amongst genders. If this gender gets this right, so should this gender. If we think that this is bad for this gender, then it's bad for that gender as well, right? There's no like submission and stuff like that. I'm like, no, 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 no. But one thing that I think we kind of get away from in modern society sometimes because we think that, oh, oh well, women shouldn't, they shouldn't be in the kitchen. They shouldn't be having to do this and whatever. Some women like that. Some women are okay with that. And if you're okay with it and you enjoy it, cool. Good for you. Awesome. Just like there can be a woman that hates the concept of having children, 
there's a woman that loves the concept of having children and there's nothing wrong with either scenario just because there's obviously women like Mau Mau does not want to be a courtesan that gives sexual favors or gets into romantic situations or does anything like that. Mau Mau doesn't like that. That's not her. She wants to be an apothecary. So she's like, this isn't for me, but these three princesses, they seem to enjoy it and they like the cash and they like flouting their bodies and they like enjoy doing it. They seem to be totally fine with that. And if that's what you got to do, and if you're okay with that life, you know, Missy Elliott sings about it. <laughs> Just make sure you're ahead of the game. So if they're fine with that, and I'm sure that they all have personal desires and aspirations. Maybe they want to move beyond the brothel at some point or find true love or whatever. We don't know enough about the three princesses to know, but they are comfortable in this episode with what they're doing and they seem to enjoy the line of work that they are doing. They enjoy being these similar to geisha, these courtesans. They enjoy it. They are fine with it. Maybe the circumstances that got them there are not ideal, but they've come to accept this life and they make it work for them, which is kind of a reflection of Mau Mau from the beginning of the series. She didn't like the idea of going to the rear palace, but she's like, well, I don't like being here, but I've got, I can't help it. I'm just going to make the most. I'm going to make lemonades out of lemons. And she ended up enjoying it, aspects of it, where it became a lifestyle she was fine with. And I feel like the courtesans here are the same way. So I think that that kind of positivity, or at least the idea that, that not all women in these scenarios were 100% miserable, they made the most out of the scenarios, I think is an important topic to address. Right. And it's fine if you take a stereotypical role and you end up finding complacency or finding, you know, belonging in it, then sure, that's fine. But I think for Mau Mau's case, this is just not for her. Now, the old woman does kind of like worry me a little bit because she's like, oh, well, you look great. You could take on customers of your own, too. And Mau Mau's like, I don't want to do that. So, no. But she's like, the old lady really wants me to become a courtesan because she wants money, right? And she's like, I can't recite poetry. Oh, she says, I can't recite poetry or play the air who. She's like, dancing is out of the question as well. I'm just an apothecary's daughter with no interest outside of medicine. So yeah, that's the thing. Mau Mau just doesn't want anything to do with the courtesan lifestyle. She's grown up around it. She respects it. She understands it. She gets why it's got its place here and what it does. But she also sees the underside of it and the dark side of it. And it's kind of like if if your family wants you to become a doctor because it'll make you money and inadvertently them money, but you have no interest in it or skills in it, it's not going to work out. That's just how it is, right? It's like my, my family for a long time were like, well, do you want to become a doctor? And I'm like, I'm not good at math and science, so that's not going to work. <laughs> Try again. So... I, Mau Mau's kind of in that same boat. She's like, she just wants to practice medicine and what she was doing in the rear palace would, you know, wh and while she was in the rear palace, it was allowing her to do that. So then she questions, why is she so insistent, especially these past few years? Well, because Mau Mau has gone through puberty, she's pretty, and the woman owning the brothel sees the chance to make money. That's, that's the deal, right? And she's looking at a capitalistic opportunity. I There can be people that seem really nice, but maybe don't have your best interests in mind. And that's that's the vibe I get from the woman in the in the brothel. It was cute when she was a kid, but now that she's old enough and has, is pretty and can make her some money, it's maybe a different story. So they go to this bougie military man's house. Very bougie. Like all the lanterns, the koi ponds. I think it's interesting to see a wealthy establishment outside of the palace. Like, because when we think of, you know, the Imperial Palace, we think that that's like the hub of all the money and trade and everything. But this episode kind of reminds us that, no, there are people outside of the Imperial Palace and outside of the royal family that have money and have influence, which I think is going to, again, be a thing. I'm fully expecting one of these wealthy military men who have made their money and settled down to see Mau Mau and be like, oh, I want her. And then Jin Shi's gonna have to be like, because the emperor doesn't have any attachment to her at all. It's just Jin Shi. So it's like, Jin Shi, you gonna flex your authority or what we gonna do? So I'm fully anticipating that happen. We'll just have to see if it goes through or not. 
I also like that Mau Mau resists the urge to steal something from the mansion because it's like she could probably get away with it at the Imperial Palace because of Jinshi. Jinshi spoiled her in a sense. But here she's like, oh yeah, no, I can't get rid of that. I can't get away with that. So they go in where these military, you can see Jinshi. Oh my God, you can see him. I missed him the first time around because he's by the curtains looking miserable. Oh my God. So essentially, Gao Xun probably made Jinshi go to this meeting knowing Mao Mao was going to be there. He made Jinshi go and was like, just go and have a good time. And Jinshi's like, I'm not going to have a good time because I'm, I'm sad. And so he was just sitting there wallowing in pity and despair and wasn't looking on stage to see who was working there. Gao Xun, you genius. I didn't even notice him there at first. So yeah, we see all these military men that are dressed kind of like Gao Xun. And then all the women come in to do their dance. She's like, he knows a lot of rich people. He should have introduced me to them sooner. She's like, I could have lessened my loan amount. And then she's like, I could have got more money. Anyway, off to work. I do love that we see the three princesses doing their gifts. We have the one that can play the instrument, the one that can dance, the one that can sing. They all have these very traditional talents. And they do look beautiful on the stage. And I love how everything sparkles around them. And of course, all the men are like entranced by them, except Jinshi. <laughs> he does not care for any of them. No, no, ma'am. So yeah, she's over there serving to all the men, just pouring their tea as all the other girls go around doing the same. I like there's a shogi board and the one, the one woman is like, she comes up to the shogi board like she's going to play against him, which could be something that she does. She's like, work is work, but staying all smiles is an ordeal. She's like, why do I have to put on a customer service smile this entire time? And then she sees Jinshi, who hasn't even touched his fish. <laughs> hasn't even touched his fish. She's like, is he bored? Well, yes, because he's sad. And he's like, I want to be alone. Aww. He And the, the truth of the matter is he doesn't want to be with any other woman except for Mau Mau. And the fact that she, he gets on, she gets on to him for trying to touch her. But I'm like, girl, you brushed his bangs back. You started this. And that's when she sees him. And she's like, why'd you avoid me? She's like, people, do people tell you that makeup changes you considerably? And she's like, yes. And he's like, well, why are you dressed like that? And she's like, well, I'm a courtesan. And the thing about it is, Jinshi didn't realize she was going to be there. And he's like, a courtesan. He's like, he's like, are you, are you selling yourself to other men? Are they seeing you? Like... Of course, the jealous trope of somebody. And she was like, well, no, not yet. I like that she gets on to Jinshi being like, do you really think I'm like that? Do you really think I'd sell myself? Which we know that Jinshi knows now that she didn't with Lee Haku, but still him being, I feel like Jinshi believes she's so nonchalant about everything and so unbothered that she would do it because it would be the right thing to do for the sake of the brothel. And he's like, and freaking out. And she's like, well, I don't take personal customers yet. And of course he's freaked out. He's like, yet. And so he's like, well, what if I bought you? And then she's like, well, what kind of joke is that? And then she's like, wait a minute, that could be a good idea. <laughs> Which I was like, yes, yes, that's perfect. Let him buy you because you think that he doesn't care about you. You th And obviously here's the thing. She thinks he's a eunuch. So he's not going to try anything sexual with her to her knowledge. She also knows that he's a familiar person, but he's not going to hurt her. So she's like, yes, perfect. And she's like, and if you buy me, I don't have to be here doing this other stuff. She's like, I don't have to put on the customer service smile and pour tea all day because we know each other. I don't have to do that with you. And if he takes her back to the rear palace, she doesn't have to stay in the brothel. So mm -hmm. she's like, you know, working in the rear palace again wouldn't be too bad. And I like Jen. She's like, what? He's just like, well, I thought you quit because you hated it there. And she's like, when did I ever say that? I'm so glad they talked about it in this episode. Because I was like, I, one thing I hate is when there's miscommunication and there's obviously a channel and a place to solve it. And they just don't do it because they're stubborn or stupid. And I know that people will be like, well, it's realistic. And I'm like, I don't care. This is a fantasy story. I'm, I'm watching this for escapism, damn it. Not for realism. I'll go be in the real world if I want that. So I was really afraid that there was going to be this miscommunication that was going to last for like episodes. No, we clear this shit up right here, right now. 
as we should. And she's like, well, when did I say I wanted to quit? And Jen, she's like, she's like, I tried convincing you to let me stay and you fired me anyway. Which, to be fair, she didn't do a very good job of convincing. She did the bare minimum. So I could understand why he didn't realize that. And she's like, yeah, there was a lot of trouble. But where else would I be able to perform as a taster? She's like, the only thing I missed were my poison experiments. She's like, she's like, the only thing I was regretting was seeing my dad and being able to experiment with poison back home. But that was it. I don't really have ties to anything else. She's like, I didn't mind being there. I got to do what I liked. And Jin, she's like, oh, well. He's like, oh, thank goodness. He's like, you're an idiot. You should have just said something. He's like, you should stop experimenting with poison. And she's like, well, I'm not. <laughs> and of course she notes how childish he is, but that's, that's how he really, you know, that's part of his actual personality. And he's like, but that's the kind of person that you are. And she's like, well, what does that mean? He's like, well, have people ever said that you don't express yourself clearly? And she's like, yeah, I do get that a lot. And then I like that he goes to touch her. And I like that Jin, she's like, look, he's like, I could make fun of you for experimenting with the poison. I think it's a bad thing. You're going to get hurt. <laughs> but that's how you are. So I'm not going to judge you for who you are. And then he goes to like touch her and she's like, he's like, why did you flinch? And she's like, well, rules are rules. And he's like, well, can't you bend them a bit? can't you bend them a bit? And she's like, well, you didn't bend the rules either. And she's like, no. And he's like, well, it's not the end of the world. And she's like, well, it's ending my spirit. And he's like, just one hand, the tip of my fingers. And I like that Mau Mau's like, damn it, he's persistent. <laughs> and everybody's starting to look because the courtesans and them are noticing that they're interacting. And she's like, mm. and she could have said no. She could have said no, just pointing it out. But she's like, fine, whatever. Just the tips of the fingers. Uh, girl, you're opening a gateway. It always just starts at just the tip. <laughs> and then it goes from there. So we all know how this song and dance goes. Just the tip is a gateway. <laughs> just the fingers. And that moment when he, like, gets her lipstick. And then, like, puts it on his lips as an indirect kiss. Shut the frick up. I'm sorry. Girl, courtesans are like, oh shit. All, yeah. And him just smiling at her, she'd have been like, oh my God. <laughs> I love her freak out of being like, oh. And he's just like, mm -hmm. see, I did that. And she's like, oh my God. I, she's like, this guy, the color sticks. And of course, at this point, all the women are like looking like, like, oh goodness, what is this? Mau Mau. And they're like, I can't watch. And she's like, come on, sisters. And Gaoshin's like, yay, it worked. It worked. I love it. And Gao, she's like, Gaoshin, why are you here? I couldn't make sense of any of it. And then she says, I don't remember much what happened after that. I was like, girl, girl. I love it. I love Gaoshin's like mission accomplished. And all the women are like, oh, do you know him? He seems very nice. He's very handsome. Not bad. I love that she's like, I do remember it was really hard answering all my big sister's questions. And we have all the flowers surrounding, like, all the three sisters, like, the big giant peonies and the lilies and the little flowers. And then the little one in the center of the vase is Mau Mau. I love the symbolism. It's so pretty. Yes. So then she's like, well, I should make some freckle makeup back just in case. Now, the old woman has her come and look at someone, but I feel like it's the woman that we've seen before. And I was like, is it her mom? Is it like, who is it? And she says, no, the situation hasn't changed. And she's like, okay. And then she looks at her hair and stuff like she realizes she needs to take a bath. I wonder, I thought for a while that the woman that seems to be in a coma was maybe Mau Mau's mom, which could be the case. And I'm not ruling that out. I would also add the theory that maybe the woman is either related to the old woman that runs the brothel or is her daughter or is like her best concubine or whatever. And she's been in this coma or she's been sick. And maybe the old woman in the brothel has been keeping Mau Mau around as like an apothecary like her dad just because it's convenient to try to see if they can figure out a way to cure her. 
But as it's becoming more apparent that there's not a cure, maybe the brothel woman's being like, well, she's not going to get better. So I'm thinking maybe it's time to sell you off since you're not going to be of use to me anymore. I don't know. I want to give the old woman the benefit of the doubt, but she's throwing vibes like she really would not be opposed to selling Mau Mau off. Because she gets in the bath with her, right? And she's like, the rear palace and the brothels are pretty similar. But it's it's one thing, though. They are similar. They are cages. But it's like, if you have, there are differences, though, too. Whereas Mau Mau kind of knows, one, she knows what to expect in terms of what her job is. She's a taster and she works for Gokyo. She knows how that goes. So there is some kind of safety or security there. She knows what's going on. She knows Jinshi. So she's got to end with the law, you know, and she also has networks of support there that I don't think are necessarily at home. She has her dad, obviously, but he's an old eunuch that she's supporting. The women, the woman running the brothel, I don't trust her fully. I think she would sell Mau Mau off. The princesses, they all have their own problems to worry about. So while there is a safety net there, I think that Mau Mau has kind of found her place in the rear palace that she feels like she could be of help and of use that is different from where she's at now. I think the only thing really tying her back home is her dad and the fact that she owes the woman at the brothel. So I don't know. I love that she goes outside with the liquor and just sits there thinking about what she's going to do. She's like, there are no different, but all of those scenarios she feels closer connected to. And we do the little recap of everything that's happened over the course of this season. And then she's like, well, what do I do? I like it. I, it's mainly like, where do you want to make lemonade? You've got lemons in all the scenarios. Where's the best place to make lemonade at? So then a few days later, a beautiful noble came to the Pleasure District in a carriage that's Aduo's colors, you know, like you do. And he basically bought her. He basically paid the old woman all the money to get Mau Mau. He brought enough cash to make the old lady's eyes glisten. And for some reason, a strange herb growing from an insect. I love that Jinshi was like, I'm going to buy, I'm going to give the old woman money so she's happy. We've got that, you know. I, also, they say a noble. I'm like, he's the emperor's brother. Is that not a big deal? Is that not a big deal? And then the insect, the herb growing from the insect, it's like, Mau Mau, of course, is like, oh, my God, you got me a little bug. How cute. And she's like, this wasn't hard. I like that she both danced around it. Like, both of them are dancing for the things that they got. And she's like, really? <laughs> In exchange, he asked for a certain girl. He's like, I gave you the bug. Now let's go. Gave you the herb from the bug. Let's go. Mm hmm. So good. So maybe, I mean, here's the thing. We don't know exactly what he's going to have Mau Mau do because he technically laid her off. So I don't know if she can exactly go right back into the rear palace. I don't know if she can exactly go right back in because... Maybe it's going to be harder than it seems to just jump right back into the ship. I don't know if the Emperor would immediately take on for Gokyo and approve her getting a new lady-in-waiting that had been someone laid off. It's not impossible. I'm not saying it can't be done. I just, I feel like he'd be like, but why? And Jin, she'd have to be like, <laughs> it's not that I love her or anything. It's just, <laughs> she's a apothecary. She's really talented. So maybe she'll go back and be like the doctor's apprentice. Maybe. Maybe work for him. Maybe. Maybe work for another lady-in-waiting. It would be kind of cool if she worked for Lee Hua for a while and just, like, got back in that way. I don't know. Or maybe she'll get in with the new concubine and work for her. I don't know. I'm really curious about that. But the title of this episode was called The Eunuch and the Courtesan. And all I could think of to tie back to our question of if Jin Shi is a eunuch or not is the eunuch and the courtesan is referring in multiple ways. It's one, in a sense, referring to the roles that those people play. So both the eunuch and the courtesan are bound in a system that is like a cage. 
but the question is, what are you going to do while you're in the cage? Are you going to sit there and suffer? Are you going to make lemonade out of lemons? Are you going to work your way up the ladder? What are you going to do? So the title is referring to not only the roles that people play, it's also referring to Mao Mao and Jinxi because Mao Mao is the courtesan in this episode. Jinxi is the eunuch. But what's interesting is they are not that. Mao Mao is not wanting to be nor really a good courtesan. She's like, no, I'm not really a courtesan. I, they want to try to sell me off as one, but that's not what I am. I'm an apothecary. And so then the question is, is Jinxi a eunuch? Or is he just pretending to be for the sake of duty or whatever? I don't know. So it's just, what do we do with that? So I, I really enjoyed this episode a lot. I'm glad that we cleared up that miscommunication between the two of them. It was so romantic. I'm I'm rooting for them so much, but you know this show is not going to make it easy for us. So now we just got to see what's going to happen. He's paid off the old landlady for now. So we'll see if that's enough to pay her off for good or what we're going to do. But he literally came to her with like, I, instead of a proposal of a ring, it's an, it's an herb from an insect. She'd be happier with the herb from an insect than the ring. <laughs> Which is so funny because, again, I talked to you about my coworker that's a lot like Mau Mau. Her and her fiancé just got engaged like a month ago. And she she doesn't like wedding rings. She doesn't like jewelry. She doesn't like wedding rings. She, again, she's very much like Mau Mau. But she likes, like, she likes rocks and archaeology. So, literally, he got her a, a pebble, a stone. Like, an actual rock is what she wanted. And that's what he got her. And I'm like, y'all are so Mau Mau and Jinchi coated. Cannot even. But anyway... I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. And yeah, I'll be back next week when we start Core 2, Episode 13 of The Apothecary Diaries. Bye!